is here and now we're going to move forward with strategy and planning. We have the housing urban development, uh, Crow Tribal Housing Development Director, Carl Little be coming here pretty quick. Uh, he's at lunch and uh, we're going to give it over to Lane here to uh, officially inform us how to uh, move forward on um, strategy and planning. And then uh, he's going to talk about some ideas of Singapore, Guam, Philippines, different things like that. We studied the world. And so, with that, uh, come on over here, Lee. And, uh, you know, we just got to keep on providing education and keep on hacking away at it like an axe. Yes, Thank you, sir. Uh, that's definite. We, uh, this is our last day, and man, all week we've been running and running, trying to get here on time and stuff, so we just went and had a, had a lunch. We, went, we sat down and had lunch this time. We've been waiting for Carl. Part of what happened with Carl today is yesterday he was, yesterday evening he was informed that HUD was coming to do an inspection. And so he was our, supposed to be our morning presenter but since HUD came, he's he's the head of housing, so he had to go through that. Uh, I heard he's at lunch, and so while we're waiting for him to get here, I'm going to fill in the gap a little bit. Some of the things that we've been talking about is what we want to do to build our nation, to bring it back from where it was, and uh, restructure ourselves to where, to where we can be prosperous in the future. One thing we have to remember is it's not an instant process. It takes a while for all of these things to take place. We have to plan them out. We can't just all of a sudden say, this is it, let's do it. So <clears throat> in the process, uh, one, one good one to look at, or two good, good ones to look at, I have a whole chunks model for their strategic plan and I also have Singapore's model and you guys might wonder why why are we going to look at Singapore one of the things that we want to do in the world that we knew before the reservation life we traded with everybody that we knew all other tribes that were close to us we even went distances to trade with people that's how we got the horse we went way down there and brought it back in that process, we were actually international, we were an international people back then because we, we worked with everybody that we could, that we could reach. Now, that's a little bit bigger. That, that, that sphere of influence we could have is a little bit bigger. We can have influence all over the world now. And one is especially in China, Singapore, Japan, things like that because they need coal. And it's best for us to understand what we need to do to provide coal to them so that they would want to come to us. Um, in 2010, when I was going through my bachelor's degree program, I studied China or coal to China. And at the time, I found out that, say like, this is, this is the curve of, of the world in coal pro or producing and, and using coal. Okay, it goes along that kind of a, a pretty normal curve. China's, now that they become more industrialized, all of a sudden just went like this and started rising. So where we're at here, they started shooting up like that to where their coal, coal needs are twice that of the rest of the world combined. That's a lot of coal. They've gone to the point where they don't even export coal anymore. They used to, they used to export it. Now everything that they, they mine themselves, they use. Plus they have to import it. And when I was doing my, my study, you know, I might have it on this disc that I have here, or this uh, stick that I have down here. Memory stick. <laughs> It's a good thing we have these memory sticks because I couldn't remember all of this. 
Votaram. Well, I was just looking at something on Facebook. It says there's two bad things about getting old. It says the first thing is you lose your memory. It says I can't, I can never remember what the second thing is. Okay, now this is when many stars were still there and we thought it was still going to go. And this is nothing more than an assignment that I did for school. I didn't, I'm not a technical advisor for many stars or the coal company or anything. We just had a, it was an assignment that we had to research a means to provide a service to somebody else, and I chose the coal. So I was looking at a coal export plan for China. Gave it, give it some background information. Many Star CTLs planning to build a coal and liquid refinery plant to harvest coal in the southeast region of the Absalaga land. And then I showed where it was. This is where they're planning on building it. Is down here somewhere? Correct? Anybody know? It was right around there, in the in the, those in those deposits. And then I, I talked about some of the hindrances to that. That was the big hindrance because they couldn't find any money to get it started, or they didn't, couldn't find the funding to get it started. And then we then I then I went and showed them or talked to them about China needs coal. This was a marketing strategy, actually. I think. Their national need has risen greatly. Now this is what I'm talking about. This is China's coal need right here. 2005, this is 2000. Hold on, let me adjust that. Hold on. By two, oh no, that's 2025. 2015, we're, we're right about here now. See where they're just capping over, over the rest of the world. This is the rest of the world. This is their coal needs. By 2035, they'll need, where we need about 50, what was it, um, quadrillion BTU, they'll need over 100, almost 120. That's how much coal China is wanting to take, all right? They have stopped exporting coal and are now importing to meet needs. This is what their imports are. And this is what their exports were at one time in 01 to 05. They were really starting to sell it out. But at 09, they, they cut way back and now they've gotten to the point where they don't, they don't export anymore. And this is their importing how much they're importing. And that's in million tons. So now they're importing a year, well that was back in 2010, they're importing 15 million tons of coal a year. Some of China's major importers of the 100 million plus coal needs are pulling back. During this time, Indonesia start, stopped, or started to cut back on selling their coal. The Indonesia's here, and they were real, they're close to China, so it was a good deal for, for uh, Indonesia, but for some reason they decided they didn't want to do it anymore. And then Australia in that year went through floods that were of biblical proportions. If you look here, this is an island. That's the mine. All of their all of Australia's mines looked like that. They were flooded out. Okay? So because of this, two things happened. And Indonesia cut back and Australia couldn't produce. 
then the suggestion I made, since both of those things happened, the price of coal shot up that for China to buy. And uh, one of the things I suggested is to raise capital would be to mine some first and sell it. And uh, the royalties from the Westmoreland mine, the Exalga mine at the time, the was 13, or the, they were paying 13.50 a ton. So our royalties from that are pennies on the ton. Coal to China royalties, they were paying $400 a ton during that time because all of their, their, their coal that they were bringing in was gone. They couldn't get it from Indonesia, they couldn't get it from Australia, so they had to get it from other sources. So that was the difference between the Dalga mine and, and uh, the China. I thought that was a good indicator. So if, I figured if uh, I just took something here, if we if we if we pr produced eight million dollars or eight million tons in a year, and sent it to them, times four hundred dollars would have been three point two billion dollars for a year, gross. That would give us the, the opportunity to build the plant, the plant, provide infrastructure, increase per capita payments. And then this was the exporting challenges, getting coal to 